So welcome to Good Vibrations. We're up to volume 43. Welcome back to all the regulars and welcome to all new listeners. You might want to go back and check out some of the previous volumes. We've covered all kinds of alternative subjects that you don't normally hear talked about elsewhere. Uh, from chemtrails to paedophilia in the British establishment, natural law to reincarnation to astral projection, occult symbolism in music and visual clues in the movies of Stanley Kubrick, to name but a few. We're taking it back to music today, which is, you know, the thing that's close to my heart, and also the guest that we have on. And we're chatting with author and researcher and fellow lifelong music fan and L.A. dweller, Dave McGowan. Welcome along, Dave. Well, thank you for having me. So uh, you, of course, are the writer of the series of web articles that were titled Inside the L.C., the strange but mostly true story of Laurel Canyon and the birth of the hippie generation. And we've now got the book, which has just been launched, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, all about the community, the neighborhood in Los Angeles of Laurel Canyon and uh, some of the stuff that has gone on there in, in music legend and music lore. So do you just want to start out by telling us what first put you on the path to examining the activities at Laurel Canyon from back in the day. Back in the day? Um, it was entirely accidental. Um, I've gotten, you know, people that have uh, followed my interviews have probably heard this story way more times than they want to. But, um, you know, basically I've been, you know, a researcher and blogger and uh, whatnot for uh, since going on 20 years now since like 19 i think my first website went up in 1997 my first book was published in either 99 or 2000 okay um so you know i've, I've been i've been uh i've been looking in in the dark corners of the conspiracy world for for quite a while now and, and i'm pretty familiar with a lot of uh rather dark and uh ominous topics sure and um but uh Stumbling upon Laurel Canyon was was entirely accidental. Um, I, I grew up here. I've lived lived here my entire life. I, w I was born in 1960, so I was a very young lad when all of this played out. I had no awareness of it at the time, but I was uh, geographically uh, right here in the area while, while it was playing out, but but had no awareness of it at all. And um, anyway, back in uh, 2007, 2008. Um, my daughter had gotten me a copy of Michael Walker's book, Laurel Canyon, which had just come out, uh, brand new in 2007, which was really the first mainstream treatment of the, uh, Laurel Canyon scene. And I was very interested to read it and took it with me when I went on vacation with the idea that I was going to get away from all, you know, all of the, all of the stuff that I normally, you know, look into in my day-to-day -day life, you know, I kind of wanted to just escape all of that and turn off my brain and just kind of roll the clock back. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I figured this would be the perfect light, you know, beach reading, just, uh, you know, conjure up all these great memories of all this music that, that really provided the soundtrack to my early years, you know. And, yeah. um, and it didn't quite work out that way. It was, yeah, it just was, you know, going to be the perfect escapist entertainment for a vacation. And instead, uh, what I found was that all these alarm bells were going off, you know, and I just could not get through the book quick enough and <laughs> just, just could not wait to get back to my computer and back to somewhere where I could start ordering books and accessing more information on this, on this topic. And, uh, you know, that eventually led to a, what was initially, I envisioned as a very short series of web posts, you know, just kind of an interesting diversion from whatever it was I was working on at the time, which I don't even remember what that was. And instead, it just kind of took on a life of its own and almost immediately started finding an audience, you know, far beyond anything else I'd ever done, any of the other topics I'd ever tackled previously this one really seemed to resonate with a lot of people and uh you know yeah um and so it just grew and grew and grew and i started getting feedback from people and you know people were saying you know hey have you read this article have you read this book have you checked out this website and and uh so with a lot of help and feedback from my readers it just continued to grow and grow and grow into something that i had never really initially envisioned and then uh, it eventually reached, you know, book length, essentially, and then I started getting publication offers. Um, eventually got three of them, the first two from U.S. publishers who uh, 
both of whom I just did not really get a good vibe from. You know, I mean, I was very skeptical that any publisher would really handle this material in the way that I thought it should be handled. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I have a hard time turning over control of my material to anyone else, which is why I, I've been very comfortable working on the web because I have complete editorial control of my material, you know? Oh, yeah. And um, so I was very skeptical, and I passed on the first two offers and then ultimately got one from a publisher over on your side of the world in London, Head Press. So now it is a book. And it is uh, contains everything that was in the original series and a whole bunch of additional material, just lots and lots of uh, a, a new preface, a new foreword, uh, I think five new chapters, a new epilogue, a bibliography, an index, and uh, various augmentations of uh, some of the existing chapters. So um, okay. it is uh, it is the very same story, but but greatly expanded and augmented now and. Um, a couple, a couple of people actually don't, have not realized that that I'm the same person that that wrote the uh, inside the LC articles and have, have kind of accused me of basically stealing. Hey, didn't you steal this story from that guy on the internet? So the crux of the story is looking at the hugely disproportionate number of uh, artists, music artists, and groups that uh, congregated in the Laurel Canyon community towards the end of the 60s and this is what was termed the counterculture sort of anti-establishment birth of the hippie movement basically and uh, as I say there was just a huge number of artists that for one reason or another just seemed to flock to that area whereas legend and lore has it that the hippie movement was birthed up in San Francisco in the sort of hate Ashbury area of, of that city which is not really the case is it? No, it's not. That, that's that's one of the strangest things about this story is that um, it's only very, very recently, like I said, you know, uh, Michael Walker was really the first one to do a book length treatment. And uh, you know, there's been a, a couple few others, uh, Canyon of Dreams by Harvey Kubernick and uh, Hotel California by Barney Hoskins and um, some of the work by uh, John Einerson and Richie Unterberger and Barry Miles have touched on it. But uh, Still to this day, it's it's a very downplayed, uh, the whole Laurel Canyon scene. And whenever anyone, virtually anyone, thinks of the 60s and the hippies and the flower children and that whole music and countercultural scene, their mind immediately goes to Haight-Ashbury, which is you know viewed as the birthplace and the the spiritual center of the whole hippie movement. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of the great myths, because it actually began down here a couple of years earlier and was a much, much bigger scene, just spawned a mind-boggling number of bands and solo artists that, uh, I mean, far more than San Francisco produced, uh, you know, and, and it was here that, you know, the hairstyles, the clothing styles, you know, all of the things that would uh, become the trademarks of the hippies and the flower children all actually began here, and that, you know, e even that... Even that aspect of the story uh, is is really unknown by so even people live you know like me and and all the people that I grew up with you know nobody uh, nobody nobody most or most people in L A uh, even L A natives don't do not realize that uh, you know there was this hugely influential scene here that actually preceded the scene the parallel scene up north yeah um, the famous Scott McKenzie song should have maybe been called if you're going to Laurel Canyon be sure to wear some flowers in your hair and not San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good it really uh, yeah I mean because you know I mean th th there was this whole vibrant scene there and you know just an amazing array of bands you know uh, the you know the, everyone from the birds Buffalo Springfield Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention Arthur Lee and Love the Mamas and the Papas the Turtles the Monkees, the Beach Boys, Three Dog Night, Captain Beefheart, uh, various bands that Graham Parsons put together, you know, International Submarine Band, Flying Burrito Brothers, uh, a whole bunch of them that I'm leaving out because it's impossible to remember them all. I always leave out a whole bunch of them. Uh, Steppenwolf, um, Alice yep. Cooper, strangely enough, oh, really? part of the scene. I mean, just people you wouldn't even expect uh, to, the, the, they don't even quite seem to fit in. As well as just uh, an array of singer and songwriters, you know, uh, Carol King and um, Joni Mitchell and Judy Collins and Judy Sill and Jackson Brown and James Taylor and um, 
you know, various songwriters before, you know, they kind of made their name for themselves, you know, people like Paul Williams, Warren Zevon, uh, you know, and then in the, in the latter stages, you had all these, these just giant, like, super groups come out uh, of the canyon, like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, the Eagles, uh, Fleetwood Mac was uh, didn't start out there, but uh, <clears throat> became part of that scene when they added uh, Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, mm. and so uh, you know some of, some of the biggest albums of all time, you know, like the Hotel California and Rumors and uh, you know CSN's first album, um, you know some of the first albums that just that just went into the stratosphere were were products of of the Laurel Canyon scene, so. Yeah. Um, Huge, huge, hugely influential scene, and uh, with uh, just so many artists that to the to this day are household these iconic household names. Yeah, really. Uh, the door. I think I forgot the Doors actually. Jim Morrison and the Doors, of course. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, and all kinds of others that I'm forgetting. There's just just an amazing array of of uh, these you know hugely successful and talented artists that that, that poured out of that scene and and really shaped the. The musical landscape and the cultural, the you know, the youth culture landscape for the 1960s far more so than than uh, than Haight Ashbury, which was you know basically an outgrowth of uh, of the initial scene in in Laurel Canyon. Yeah, and the Beach Boys were involved in that as well. You said to some extent they were. Yeah, um, yeah, they lived in and around there, and they you know they hung out with the uh, the other musicians. Um, Brian Wilson was actually just very very highly regarded by a lot of the people on the scene he was pretty much viewed as like the premier musicians composer arranger whatever of of that era just you know considered just a, a massively talented guy <coughs> and um they should have maybe yeah, been the know, canyon boys they should call themselves yeah the canyon boys. you know their their squeaky clean image doesn't exactly fit with the uh the scene but um mm. yeah they they were uh, you know they they were bopping around and i mean a lot of, a lot of things about the beach boys don't you know really fit in with their squeaky clean image you know yeah. like 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 Charles Dennis Manson connection. Charlie Manson as a house guest for the entire summer of 1968. You know, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a, that doesn't quite fit in with their image either. You know? Not so. really. No. And w <laughs> where are we picking up the story with all this? We're going back to what 1964, 65? Would it be? Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, uh, 64, 65. I mean, the first band to really make their mark was the Birds, who I believe were signed and uh, released their first single circa 1965, which was uh, Mr. Tambourine Man. And uh, they were the trailblazers. They were the ones that really started the whole folk rock uh, you know, revolution, which then quickly split into several other factions country rock and psychedelic rock and uh, sort of introspective singer songwriter uh genre and uh yeah those those were all basically pioneered to a large extent in um in laurel canyon hmm. and so what happened was something drew all these artists and all these collaborators all these musicians and associates to this particular area magnet like uh, around about that time, 64, 65 onwards. It doesn't appear to have been an organic, grassroots, natural, uh, creative thing. Uh, it seems to be that there was some reason why all these people were being directed to this one particular neighborhood. Correct, yeah. It happened very, very quickly. I mean, just, you know, it does not have the look of an, or, you know, I mean, you think of a sort of a organic grassroots movement, you think of these struggling artists, you know, playing coffee houses and maybe getting on college radio and, you know, slowly working their way up to, uh, you know, some kind of mainstream acceptance or whatever. And, and this didn't happen like that. I mean, these people arrived in town and like within weeks they had fully formed bands and brand new instruments and recording contracts and studio space and rehearsal space. And, um, hmm. and it just happened so quickly. Yeah. I mean, just like all of these people just over the space of a couple of years, just really just, just simultaneously congregated on, on Laurel Canyon yeah. of all places. And, um, 
you know, people looking back, people looking at it now will say, well, yeah, of course, you know, LA's, LA's the, the music capital of the country. Why wouldn't they come here? But, but what people don't realize is that that was not the case in the 1960s. New York and the Brill Building and whatnot were still very much the, was still very much the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the capital of uh, popular music in those days. And, and Detroit. Uh, LA. Detroit was the R&B capital. Nashville was country music, and New York was, you know, pop music. Basically, mm -hmm. those were sort of the three, the three, uh, yeah, the, the the three centers of, of musical activity in the country. And, and yeah. LA was was not even close. You know, they, it did not have a a uh, real vibrant live music scene or recording or uh, you know recorded music facilities or anything. And that all grew up around. Laurel Canyon, the record companies, you know, the music industry moved here because that's where the artists were, not, you know, not the other people, you know, think it's probably, you know, well, they came here because that's where the industry was. No, the industry came here because the artists had all decided to congregate here for no apparent reason. The question becomes not only why did this happen in L.A., but why specifically did it happen in that particular neighborhood, that particular community? Because I don't think there was any kind of rich musical creative history sort of bohemian hippie style uh history to laurel canyon before this period was there no there wasn't no no um i mean you know you look at it, it, it it's a very it's a very un la sli like slice of la um if you've ever been to la uh not the most attractive city around <laughs> you know, a, lot, a lot of pavement a lot of buildings a lot of concrete you know yeah and um, Laurel Canyon is is very heavily wooded, and it's very you know very this you know very kind of country bucolic kind of feel to it. I mean, it just looks like a place where hippies would congregate, you know. So I mean, but um, you know the 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 curious part of you know one of the many curious parts of it is that it just happened to be the home of a covert. Uh, military intelligence facility that had been operational there for at least a couple of decades and remained so well, officially at least through 1969 and by some reports you know well beyond that but we know that it, even by official accounts it was operational till 1969 so through the, the first like five years the key years of this this movement all of these people just happened to be huddled literally <laughs> huddled around a, a covert military intelligence facility. So, yeah, it makes it, you know, it makes it a very rather odd place. You know, in some ways, it, you know, like I say, it, it, it's kind of set off from the city. It's very self-contained. It's, uh, I mean, it's not even a city itself. It's just, just a neighborhood within it, within the Hollywood Hills. But, um, but, but it's always kind of had its own feel to it. It's always been sort of self-contained. It's the only canyon that has its own elementary school, that has its own general store, that you know has other various businesses, and they at one time had their own newspaper and whatnot. So it's just uh, you know there's there's only really a couple of ways in and out, um, you know. So 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 it's kind of geographically isolated, and you know, like I said, very woodsy and uh, you know very very self-contained. So. In some ways, it, you know, kind of makes sense that that it would be, because it was basically converted into a giant hippie commune. You know, mm. I mean, if you read the mainstream accounts of uh, Laurel Canyon, they paint this very idyllic, you know, the, this picture of just this uh, perfect, uh, you know, communal living where everyone like had an open door policy and you could just, you know, wander wander from house to house watching these future greats. Uh, you know, composing these songs that we still hear on, you know, working out these these songs that we still hear on the radio today, you know, and hmm. and um, so, you know, in some ways it made sense, but in other ways it really didn't make sense at all that everybody should just suddenly find themselves in this tiny little isolated geographic area of Los Angeles that happened to house a covert military intelligence facility. Well, there you go. That's, so, that's, that's what's going to raise alarm bells with a lot of people, you know. And that's well, that's what, that was the first thing that raised alarm bells with me when I was reading Michael Walker's book. Yeah. And he just threw that out as an aside, you know. I mean, literally, it was in like one sentence in parentheses, you know. He was, he had been, he was talking about something else that... Hmm. Uh, you know, this didn't really quite fit the, you know, the peace and love vibe that the canyon was known for. And then in parentheses, he throws in 
also not quite fit, fitting the vibe was the covert you know yeah <laughs> i'm like yeah but then he just moves on and never mentions it again and i'm like Dude, exactly that's not the kind of thing you can just throw on the table and walk away from you yeah, know tell, really. tell me some more about this you know so yeah. those were the kind of things that i mean i had a mental list when i got home from the vacation of all the things that i that i thought i needed to look into you know these little these little th things that he was just putting in there as throwaway facts and i'm like you know, I think these throwaway facts tell a whole nother story in themselves. Well, exactly. You know, there's a whole nother side of the story that's uh, that you're not quite telling us here, you know? And, and when you come at it from the perspective of having been a researcher in the sort of conspiratorial field and you understand how certain things work, you know, you, you hear about something like a covert military base and, uh, you know, as you say, the alarm bells are instantly rung. And I know that you've done a lot of research into the family backgrounds of a lot of these key musicians. And uh, there's some very interesting things that you can dig up there in terms of what their families did, what, what many of their fathers did. The most famous example would surely have to be Jim Morrison's father. Uh, yeah, J absolutely. Jim, Jim yeah, Morrison yeah. of the Doors. Uh, you don't find a real, you don't find a stranger juxtaposition than that one. I don't think between the between father and son. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, yeah. My background definitely helped. I'm I'm kind of a walking encyclopedia of uh, conspiracy facts and figures. Walk us through the Jim Morrison uh, connection first, and then we'll look at some of the others as well. Some of the more yeah, interesting Jim ones. Morrison, uh, definitely one of the most unlikely rock stars uh jim morrison's dad which uh had never been reported before before it first appeared in my web series in i think 2008 was actually the uh the navy admiral who was uh in charge of the fleet of ships that was involved in the tonkin gulf incident the notorious tonkin gulf incident he was actually the commanding officer of those ships um and as listeners may or may not know, that was, of course, the incident that uh, led America directly into a ground war, a very bloody and prolonged ground war in Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, we'd already been involved before that, but that was what provided the justification to introduce ground troops and uh, turn it into a complete bloodbath. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been all but officially acknowledged that uh, the incident likely didn't even happen. You know that the the the, uh, the ships never actually came under attack, and yeah, uh, um, you know the classic were, false flag. Classic false flag, and the classic false flag was orchestrated directly by Jim Morrison's dad, and almost yeah. simultaneous with him emerging out of Laurel Canyon as this fully formed icon of the anti-war crowd exactly um, so that was a very strange i mean it, i mean literally it was just like there's pictures of jim morrison seeing his father off uh as he's about to set sail on the uh the bonham richard which is the ship that he was uh, you know acting was the commanding officer on and there's pictures of him uh, sitting on the bridge of the ship with his dad, and you'd never even know it was Jim Morrison. You know, this real, mm. this real short-haired, clean-cut, uh, very collegiate, conservative-looking young man. You know, mm. seeing his dad, the admiral, off, and and literally months later, his dad's orchestrating the war, and not long after that, this completely different-looking and acting Jim Morrison, uh, you know, comes out of nowhere as this. Uh, larger than life iconic figure and um so yeah it was, it was an amazing transformation that he went through in a short amount of time and, and uh you know just this very bizarre juxtaposition of who the who the father is and who the son was and um what did you make of jim morrison's death at the age of 27 have you got any reflections on uh, whether there were any suspicious aspects to that because uh, people say I... that he was like an original member of the mythical 27 club all these artists that just happened to die at the age of 27. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of reason to be suspicious about the death of Jim Morrison. <laughs> I um, feel so, yeah. You know, I mean, no autopsy, no viewing of the body. They had it in the ground before they even publicly announced that he was dead. You know, it's like, oh, he's dead, but don't come and try to see the body because it's already in the ground. Yeah. In a sealed coffin in an unmarked grave and some cemetery in france where it shouldn't be but you know i mean the, the whole thing was just really weird 
And, you know, there, there's there been theorizing about it ever since, you know, uh, w w was the, was that what was the cause of death, what it was claimed to be, or did he even die at all? Was it just faked <laughs> so that he could escape the fishbowl and go on with a different life? Yeah. Which I don't really find all that uh, hard to believe, you know, because the guy had already the guy had shown an amazing capacity to reinvent himself. Um I mean, he wrote a song called The Changeling, I think, didn't he? Wasn't that one of the... You know, I mean, if you look at pictures of this guy pre-Doors, you know, and then during the Doors' heyday, and then during the latter years when he decided that he was actually a reclusive poet, you know, and put on a lot of weight and, uh, you know, heavy beard and... and uh, I mean, it looks like three different people, you know? I mean, they don't, it's the, the pre-doors, uh, this short-haired collegiate guy, and then the, the uh, you know, the Adonis, uh, you know, doors guy, and then the, uh, the latter years, you know? So hmm. in just a period of what, like, I don't know, five, six years, the guy had, had kind of rebuilt himself three times, you know, in three different, completely different personas. Yeah. So I, there's, you know, I don't find it at all hard to believe that he could have done so once again and, and uh, you know, gone on to whatever it is that he wanted to do. I have no idea, but um, I, I don't really find that all that hard to believe, really. Yeah. What are some of the other family backgrounds that you uncovered? Frank Zappa's is an interesting one, isn't it? Frank Zappa was a very interesting one. His dad was a chemical warfare engineer, initially assigned to the Edgewood Arsenal, um, which was not only the home base, uh, longtime home base of U.S. chemical warfare research, but has been implicated uh, repeatedly in various uh, unclassified MK Ultra documents. is a hotbed of MK Ultra research as well, mm. and. Um, yeah, his dad, uh, Frank Zappa, was actually born <laughs> at the Edgewood Arsenal. Uh, the family lived in, uh, in um, housing right there on the base. He went to the Edgewood School. You know, I mean, for, he lived the first seven years of his life within the confines of the Edgewood Arsenal. Was born, raised, and educated there for the first seven years of his life. Uh, which is a pretty curious, you know, background for, for, a, yeah, <laughs> for really. a rock star to have once again. For a counterculture so, artist, yeah. Yeah, and and on top of that, his wife, uh, whose uh, maiden name was Gail Slopeman, is uh, who's still alive and very protective of his legacy, from what I hear, by the way. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard she may not be too happy if she gets a copy of my book. But you know, what oh, are you well. gonna do? It happens. But um, she was all. She's also. She was from a naval uh, intelligence family. Her dad and, and various, you know, uncles and whatnot. She came from a long line of, of uh, na career naval officers, career na career navy family, mm -hmm. and um, she actually knew Jim Morrison from twenty years earlier. They knew each other as kids through naval officer circles, and had actually attended a naval kindergarten together when they were like five years old. Well, uh, according to industry legend, she actually once hit Jim over the head with a hammer when they were in <laughs> kindergarten together at five years old. Well, so, what were the uh, chances? That adds a whole, that whole, that, that adds a whole nother weird level of quote unquote coincidence to this story because not, not only did, you know, here you have these two, these two people who had known each other 20 years ago and now all of a sudden they both simultaneously arrive in Laurel Canyon. He is a, larger than life rock star and she as the wife of another larger than life rock star you yeah. know all connected through military intelligence circles mm. and you know what are the odds that that just happened by chance well exactly know? and john phillips of the mamas and papas there's some background there as well yeah there's some background there as well <laughs> yeah his dad was a career marine corps officer and um his entire family was uh was military connected his, his mother his sister and his first wife were all career employees of the Pentagon, the Defense Department. Hmm. And his first wife was also, uh, by the way, named Susie Adams, was also a direct descendant of uh, John Adams, America's second president. So she's comes, she was, uh, you know, he, he married, his first marriage was like into royal bloodline, so to speak. Um, hmm. And yeah, and his entire family. Um, was was military connected you know other than him of course you know but <laughs> hmm. 
But, you know, even he went to West Point and was being prepped, you know, for a military career. There's, there's so many of these people that have military connections that I... Uh, well, exactly. I it it gets to the point where uh, you find it difficult to find one of these prominent artists that doesn't have a family background yeah, I mean, connected exactly. to military intelligence or the government in some way. It's almost without exception, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's the real challenge is finding... Um, if you look at these bands, you know, like these bands that I, that I reeled off... Um, you know the, the people who 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 were viewed as sort of the leaders, the creative force, or who emerged as the biggest stars from those bands. You know, like David Crosby from The Birds and Stephen Stills from uh, from um, Buffalo Springfield, and you know Frank Zappa from The Mothers of Invention, and Jim Morrison from The Doors, and John. You know, on and on and on. You go through the list, and you find repeatedly that uh, yeah, that they are sons and daughters of career military officers. Or our uh, intelligence yeah. operatives, um, yeah, like time and time again, it, it, it's it's pretty remarkable, and and even even um, you know where, where there's not you know uh, explicit information available, you know, explaining who these parents were, because some, sometimes it, it's you know kind of covered up and brushed swept under the rug, so to speak. But you know, e even where there's not explicit, you know. Uh, recognition that they were in fact military people or military intelligence people um there 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 are very obvious clues that that the, the you know their parents weren't necessarily who they appeared to be yeah. you know like like graham parson's stepdad who raised him because uh, his real dad uh, committed suicide supposedly early on but it actually looked like a murder but that's a whole nother story. I mean, there's all kinds of those, you know, all kinds of curious deaths running through the book as well, but that's a whole nother topic. But anyway, his stepdad who raised him was, uh, was very, very deeply involved in training, um, Cuban expatriate groups in the Florida Everglades to overthrow, uh, the Castro regime. And, you know, I, I think we all know who was funding and directing those efforts, <laughs> So, you know, I mean, even though it doesn't specifically say in the literature that his dad was a CIA contract guy, I mean, he, he quite obviously was. I'm sure he wasn't just freelancing as a, you know, <laughs> guy training uh, expatriate Cubans. So, um, yeah, it's very hard to find anyone in that crowd that uh, does not appear to come uh, you know, among the prominent, you know, the most prominent members, the people yeah. who became like the superstars. Yeah. Uh, very, very difficult to find someone who does not appear to come from uh, from that background. It raises questions about was this something that was being done creatively by these artists expressing themselves in an artistic way? Or was the whole thing a pre-planned project uh, operating to an agenda? And this is going to shatter the illusions and the dreams of so many people that kind of grew up in that era. Those of us that weren't a part of that can only reflect on how difficult it must be to kind of embrace the suggestion that it might not have been all that it, it, it's been presented to us as. But the evidence would appear to suggest that that could well be the case. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to explain it all away, you know. I mean, the fact that so many of these people had had uh, you know came from came from military military intelligence families that they all just congregated initially for no apparent reason in the same spot that just also happened to house a military intelligence facility, yep. and that the scene came together so quickly, and these bands just. Uh, and and they, these were they, they were not you know these these were not bands that were being signed by indie upstart labels you know I mean that's another thing you know if th if this was a grassroots kind of organic movement uh, why is it that it was all of the big corporate entities that that were signing and promoting these bands you know I mean it was it was labels like Capital and Columbia that were quickly signing and putting out albums by these bands and, and you know and it was mainstream radio and the mainstream press that was promoting them and you know i mean if you look at this this was not being done through like underground channels you know like these were people that were like on college radio and and uh, you know getting written up in the underground press and and whatnot it, it, right from the start it were you know the, the titans of industry that were that got behind this movement and that bankrolled it and signed these artists and set them up with equipment and like i said you know recording space and rehearsal space and and uh you know it, it um 
the more you look at it, the more the pieces just don't seem to fit together as as this organic, you know, grassroots movement that was, you know, a thorn. And also, you know, there's the fact that this movement was supposedly a big thorn in the side of the establishment. You know, yeah. these were people who were, you know, causing trouble for the powers that be and rocking the boat. And yet all of the people that were behind all of the money that were, was behind them was, you know, corporate, corporate money. And, uh, and all of the tools that the state had at its disposal to, silence these people or intimidate them in, in various ways they opted not to use you know which was a, which yep. is another thing that doesn't really quite fit is why when there was a draft going on and the majority of the people making up this scene were young draft age males hmm. were none of their careers in or you know their fans were getting drafted left and right from all across the country right but not one of these people had their career interrupted you know and there was a military draft in effect throughout this yeah. the years that this scene played out which is supposedly why the scene was playing out to begin with as a response to the war and what maybe they were doing their work uh unbeknown to them they were doing a different kind of work for the system it seems that way i mean it really does you know and um and the fact that the you know the police uh you know g gave gave these people a free hand despite the fact that they were you know not only openly using but openly promoting and at times wholesale trafficking uh, drugs through the area and yet the police pretty much turned a blind eye to all of that you know so yeah uh, there are certainly ways that the state could have stepped in and uh, you know made trouble for the for these artists if these artists were in fact causing trouble for them and it would not have required any he heavy-handed approach all it would have required was you know um, was not letting them skate by on their draft notices, which repeatedly happened, you know? I mean, they, they received draft notices, but they all managed to get deferments in various ways, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's always written off as, oh, well, you know, he got a deferment, but he didn't take a shower for a couple of days, and he went into the draft board and acted <laughs> crazy, or, or he, you know, he did this or that. And, and I mean, come on, every, every, every kid in the country was, try, was pulling on that shit in the 1960s yeah. trying to avoid the draft. But it didn't work for them, you know, yeah. but it always, it always seemed to work for these guys, you yeah. know, repeatedly. Time after time after time, they managed to avoid the draft. And they managed to avoid getting arrested or serving any time for their numerous, you know, criminal offenses that they were known to be committing, you know, quite openly. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of problems with uh, the view that this was, you know, mm. uh, an organic movement and a movement that was that was positioned to the status quo. So this leaves the suggestion that it was an exercise in social engineering and sort of mass mind control of the public and particularly young people, you know, the young people that will be following these bands and these artists. And I think the idea is, or the idea was, to get young people uh, turning on, tuning in and dropping out, so to speak, because this went hand in hand with LSD culture. That seemed to kind of coincide yeah. with this whole movement, Timothy Leary and everything that he was Correct. doing. He's admitted that he was uh, a part of the CIA, working for the CIA. And the idea seems to have been to get young people who might otherwise have been objecting to, to the Vietnam War and going on protest marches and all of this, instead just becoming hippies and chilling out and getting groovy and listening to this music and getting stoned. Yeah, exactly. And Leary was actually there in the, in the earliest years of Laurel Canyon. I, I had a home there for a while and, uh, yeah, what was involved. And, yeah, I mean, his whole ethos was, uh, you know, t tune in, turn on, drop out. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the, the hippie ideal really, the, you know, basically what, what the, the message from the hippies was basically you can't fix the world so the best you can do is kind of create your own you know and uh you know right. go, go off and create your own little commune create your own little slice of paradise and don't worry about what's going on in, in the rest of the country the rest of the world you know which is fine for your little group but that, that's not the way to affect real social change in society you know by withdrawing into your own little uh you know your own little meditation group or whatever and yeah. and that that was basically the the message you know just drop out 
drop, you know, you can't fix it. Just drop out and create your own little little ideal community. Great way and of disengaging large numbers of young people from activism. Exactly. I that's that that is the way I see it. You know, I mean, the the way we're supposed to see it is that the hippies were the activists. But uh, yeah, I see it as as a way to to absolutely do to sabotage um, activism. Yeah. And at the same time as all these music artists hanging out in Laurel Canyon, there, there are a bunch of up-and-coming Hollywood, or Hollyweird, as some people call it, actors that were hanging out there as well, uh, I believe. Was that the likes of Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda? Would it be people like that? Correct. It was the what, what are generally termed the Young Turks, which was, yeah, uh, Peter Fonda and his, I guess, I guess you could call them Turkettes, uh, Jane Fonda and... Uh, yeah, Bruce Dern, Jack Nicholson, um, uh, who else was kind of part of that? Um, I know I'm forgetting people. Sharon Tate oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, was one of them. And, um, yeah, just sort of this young posse of, uh, you know, hot uh, Hollywood up-and-coming actors who, uh, you know, later became became these huge stars. And they were they were also very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. In fact, Peter Fonda, you know, I'm sure most people don't know this, but Peter Fonda felt himself so much a part of the scene that he actually recorded an entire solo folk rock album of his own, his own uh, folk rock tunes, which... Oh, yeah? uh, probably mercifully was never released <laughs> so i i couldn't really tell you how good it was but yeah they, they were very much a part of the scene and, and uh and and a number of the kind of cult films uh you know the, these uh sort of strange films from the 60s like you know, easy rider and mm. the trip and uh, uh the monkey's head uh were very much products of of laurel canyon and, and the various characters the intermingling of the uh the rock stars and the uh the young actors who all kind of hung out together and partied together and and worked together you know in various ways i mean uh, easy rider was very much a laurel canyon movie you know the, the two key figures uh De Dennis Hopper is basically playing uh, David Crosby. His character is modeled on David Crosby, and Peter Fonda's is is modeled on uh, either Graham Parsons or um, Roger McGuinn of the Birds, depending on who's oh, yeah. telling the story. And you know, all of the mu most of the music was all provided by you know Laurel Canyon bands, you know, mm. Steppenwolf and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it's very very movie. closely. Lo tied. Love that movie. So iconic in so many. Very movies. very closely tied to the scene. Uh, the trip, which is you know supposed to be a cinematic version of an acid trip, um, actually filmed in a home in Laurel Canyon. And uh, and the movie um, the head the monkeys movie head uh, actually uh, also very 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 closely connected to that scene and both of those by the way <laughs> I don't know how many people know this but uh, both of those movies uh, the trip and head were both uh, written by Jack Nicholson strangely enough um, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that, well, that he, uh, I didn't know that that he began his career yeah as a as a as a screenwriter of these sort of psychedelic uh, trippy hippie movies. Uh, and I think both enough. Head and Easy Rider featured a young Tony Basil who went on to do Mickey years later. I think she was in both yeah. those movies. I did not know that. I mean, I, obviously Jack Nicholson was was in Easy Rider as well. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. he, he was very much a part of that scene, and uh, you know, all of them as well. You know, come. Yeah, crazy. There's more connections. Scene, there. You know, Sharon Tate's dad, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tate, U.S. Air Force Intelligence, you know, uh, Dennis Hopper acknowledged before his death that his dad had been an intelligence operative all the way back to the OSS days, you know, the pre-CIA. His, his dad was a career intelligence operative. Uh, he acknowledged it himself, you know, and uh, Peter and Jane, even Peter and Jane Fonda's dad did Navy intelligence work, you know, Henry Fonda did Navy intelligence work, you uh, during uh world war ii and you know and he was connected to uh you know hi through marriage he was connected to uh very high level members of the Mussolini regime and to the uh, rothschild family actually oh, wow. so uh you know henry fonda may not have been the uh you know warm and cozy cozy <laughs> liberal that we that all we're american all guy to yeah it's yeah. very rare i do one of these podcasts without the name rothschild popping up somewhere they do seem to get around <laughs> really yeah well that's the, i mean every 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 conspiracy meme pops up in this story whether it's the rothschilds the rockefellers um 
I, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin. You know, they're all Skull and Bones is in there. Bruce Dern's uh, oh, yeah. uncle, I believe, was a prominent Skull and Bones man, and his step parents were uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Adelaide Stevenson or something. I mean, he had deep political connection, or he does has. He's still mm-hmm. alive. Um, you know, so again, you know, every virtually every one of the the young Turks, you know, uh, you can you can find the same curious, uh, you know, deep political and intelligence connections, and and yeah, all these names that you know that that are sprinkled throughout the conspiracy community, they pop up over and over and over again. You know, didn't you Mason's, say uh, one one of the prominent studio producers for many of these musicians was called Paul Rothschild? I think I think you said that in another interview. Paul Rothschild, yeah, spelled without the S. And, so we don't know uh, if he's uh, a, a bona fide Rothschild or if he's adopted the name or if he's uh, not According to all official accounts, he was not a Rothschild. But, you know, um, I wouldn't rule it out. I, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I don't make that claim in the book because according to all official accounts, he is not a Rothschild and the name is spelled differently. But mm. that doesn't always mean the you know that <laughs> yeah. you can't always rely on that as i you know pointed out in a recent interview um you know my the, the current topic that i've been working on is the lincoln assassination and john wilkes booth and uh recently found out that claire luce booth who um spells the booth on her name with an e and you know it was obviously a very uh you know very very widely regarded as an intelligence operative operative as was her husband henry luce who founded time and life and sports illustrated and i don't know what else and uh, you know very much regarded as as a cia couple and um and she and he was skull and bones as well actually henry luce and um you know, I found out very, very recently that lo and behold, she is actually a descendant of the very same Booth family as John Wilkes Booth, but her branch of the family added the E onto it many generations ago to try to conceal that fact yeah. so that she would not be connected to it. So it's there not unheard of. It's not unheard of for these people to, you know, to, to use different variations in spelling in their names and yeah. stuff to throw people off the scent. But do I have any concrete evidence that he was, in fact, a member of the, you know, the Rothschilds? No, I do not. Yeah. But, you know, it, I, it's possible. That's I remember all I jo- John C. Riley's character in the movie Boogie Nights, the Paul Thomas Anderson movie, was Reed Rothschild. He played a porn star called Reed Rothschild without the S again. So uh, that was an interesting choice of name for that movie. I couldn't help thinking. Um, yeah, I don't. I watched. I saw that movie. I don't remember that. That movie was. That movie was basically a uh, you know Hollywoodized version of a uh, of a brutal quadruple murder that occurred in Laurel Canyon <laughs> on on Lookout Mountain. Um, you know the the story's told more much more literally in uh, the movie Wonderland with Val Kilmer. <coughs> um, but yeah, yeah, the Boogie Nights contained a very, very uh, stylized uh, version of it, and um, yeah, that was that was that was one of the mo- you know, and, and as I said earlier, that that's an, another thing that that doesn't quite fit with this scene is all of the violent deaths that were so closely associated with it, and uh, well, yeah, yeah, I mean the Sharon Tate murders are obviously the yeah, the ones that well, spring those to are two, those, away. those are the two. Those are the two, you know, prime examples. Was the, uh, you know, the, the five victims uh, murdered on Cielo Drive that actually occurred in, in Benedict Canyon, a, a couple few canyons over. But but virtually all of the people involved, both uh, victims and perpetrators, were very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. You know, Folger and Frykowski were actually living on Woodrow Wilson Drive, right across the road from uh, Mama Cass's house, and. Um, Jay Sebring was very closely tied to the scene. Uh, he was the guy that was credited with creating uh, Jim Morrison's iconic uh, hairdo. You know, mm-hmm. his Alexander the Great hair, and he was a business partner of John Phillips. And uh, you know, Sharon Tate frequently hung out in Laurel Canyon with that. Uh, she was friends with uh, Mom McCass, and John Phillips was known to be a frequent visitor to their homes. And yeah. so all all of the people, all of the people, although the murders occurred in uh, in and Benedict Canyon, all of the people, um, you know, and, and Manson and and his followers were, were Laurel Canyon regulars too. So, uh, very closely connected. And then the second one was the, the quadruple Wonderland murders, which occurred right in the heart of Laurel Canyon. Um, 
So those are those are just the two most notorious uh, acts of violence that uh, that were very closely associated with that whole scene. Yeah, there so, were very very many others. <laughs> yeah, what happened to the whole Laurel Canyon community then, as the '60s turned into the '70s? Did it just kind of dissolve and disintegrate, and everyone gradually moved away and started sowing their musical seeds elsewhere? I mean, how how did it yeah. all kind of break down and dissipate? I yeah, just sort of sort of started to dissolve. It, it would appear like in the mid '70s. Um, one for one thing, you know, cocaine came flooding in there and uh, just really changed the whole vibe of the canyon. Um, you know, from the, you know, the communal pot smoking hippies to these, uh, frenzied, insane, uh, coke heads, you know, and, um, really, uh, really, you know, according to various accounts, really kind of, kind of just, uh, destroyed the whole vibe that had been there. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's the principal reason. I think there was probably a lot of reasons, uh, you know, it had served its purpose and, uh, you know, everyone kind of moved on basically, but, um, yeah, it really, you know, had its heyday through the late sixties and er, into the early seventies, and and by like the mid the mid seventies or so, it was uh, it was pretty dead. And, yeah. and one of the one of the I mean one of the big problems is that uh, you know this this started out as a club scene, you know, in sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven. Um, these uh, you know these bands that were living in Laurel Canyon were you know pouring out regularly pouring out of the canyon on the evenings down under the Sunset Strip to uh, play all these clubs, which just popped up like mushrooms you know in the mid the late 1960s you just had all of these clubs just popping up out of nowhere the London Fog and the Whiskey and the Kaleidoscope and Pandora's Box and uh, Beto Litos and just on and on and on many many long forgotten now and. Um, but what happened is that uh, basically uh, from the, like the Monterey Pop Festival on, which was in, what, 1967, I believe, which is really what kind of introduced this whole Laurel Canyon sound and the, uh, and the uh, British invasion and, and San Francisco sounds to, to the rest of the country. And from that point on, the, these bands uh, were too big to play the clubs. And they very quickly went from clubs to, you know, much larger venues to, you know, uh, venues like the Forum and the Sports Arena here in L.A. And, you know, by the time, like, uh, like I said, like uh, these just monster super groups like the Eagles and, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and, and uh, you know, Rumors Era, Fleetwood Mac and whatnot came along in the early 70s. They'd become so big that they were playing like sports arenas you know like a hundred thousand seat they had gone from these small intimate clubs to hundred thousand seat uh arenas over the course of just you know like five years yeah um and you know that that's what really made the music industry what it is today this huge multi you know i mean uh, albums that never sold that many copies uh before mm. you know some of some of these just huge uh and and bands that never played you know venues any, anywhere near that size. Um, so, in a very very short period of time, uh, they really the, the Laurel Canyon scene really changed the whole commercial face of the music industry, and uh, they basically outgrown that entire scene. Hmm. What's the neighborhood like now? What sort of place is it now? Um, you know, if you would waited a few days to do this interview i put i could have had a much more complete answer for you yeah, you've got this festival <laughs> coming up right i am going to be spending virtually the entire day there on sunday i mean i don't know if i'm going to make it the entire day because for one thing i think it's supposed to be like 93 degrees or something mm -hmm. ungodly and uh but yeah there's a 12 hour street fair going on from 11 a.m to 11 p.m and i'm gonna be there mingling with the locals and uh hanging out and answering questions and i mean i've driven through there a number of times i've gone on uh photo missions in there taking pictures of uh all of these you know formerly uh you know uh iconic type places or what's left of them because you know a lot of them are gone the, the log cabin's gone the houdini mansion and whatnot um so I've, I've spent time there i've been through there i've taken pictures there i've walked through that and whatnot but i've never really 
really kind of uh, hung out for any, you know, mm. like spent a whole day there and mingled with the locals and whatnot. So, um, Does it still have know, a maybe, reputation maybe, for being sort of bohemian and, and kind of, you know, hippie-ish? In its very field? much, very much so. The, the people, um, you know, I, I, this friend of mine who's a local artist who actually lives there is the one that invited me to uh, participate in this. And she, she introduced me to the couple of the organizers who... Uh, who look like they're straight out of 1969. One of them's known as Hippie John. That's his name, <laughs> Hippie mm. John. That's what everybody calls him, apparently. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they, you know, they, yeah, they kind of still think of themselves to some extent as uh, as latter day hippies. You know, at least a, at least a portion of the of the locals do. And uh, mm. there's no, I, you know, there's still a few, some people. You know, Zappa's widow still lives there in his, uh, you know, former home, uh, I believe. And uh, you know, some some stars still come out of there. You know, more more recently. I mean, not like real recently, but um, like uh, Slash, the uh, guitarist for uh, Guns N' Roses, was yeah. uh, born was born and raised there. He kind of grew up there in the '70s during the latter days of the scene, okay. and then uh, you know emerged as a star in his own right. And um, one of the guys in the Chili Peppers, I think Anthony or Flea, either maybe Flea. I think Flea, or or maybe Kai. I'm not sure. One of one of those two also uh, grew up, uh, was born and raised there, and and then emerged as a as a star in his own right. And uh, Rick Rubin, I don't think he does anymore. But the Def Jam guy. Fairly, yeah, until fairly recently, he was the occupant of the, the uh, gigantic mansion that sits just north of the log cabin that was by industry legend anyway at one time occupied by errol flynn and later by uh jimmy hendrix um while while he was briefly in living in the area and um uh, so it's you know it's a home with a hollywood pedigree and uh fairly recently occupied by uh rick rubin who um had a home studio there and uh recorded uh you know various artists have recorded there like yeah. um System of a Down, I think, uh, and and uh, Guns N' Roses actually filmed their the video for November Rain hmm. at the home on the terrace of uh, of uh, this Laurel Canyon home. So, so there's still some musical presence there uh, to some degree. There's still there's still scattered remnants, I guess you could say, of uh, of its yeah. former glory. Yeah, there's something about the 1960s to suggest that the control system really kind of stepped up its game big time in that decade uh, i mean when you factor in like jfk bobby kennedy martin luther king malcolm x you got the start of the vietnam war the black panther movement all the civil rights movements that were going on uh lsd the psychedelic era so much happened in that decade that that changed society and sort of changed the world and was responsible for so many ripples that you know spread forth and you, you look yeah, at you, you, look, you look at the 1950s and the 1970s and there was some stuff going on in those decades but they were relatively low-key by comparison you know a, a lot went on in the 60s and it seems that uh -huh. that decade had been earmarked for massive social change Oh, very much. Yeah, I mean, I I basically came of age in the 1970s, which was quite possibly the most culturally vapid decade of all time. But yeah, yeah, the 60s was. I mean, yeah, it was a seriously. To, I mean, just there was just so much going on with you know the the the, the black empowerment movement with the Black Panthers. You had the Gray Panthers, you know, fighting for elderly rights. You had the women's liberation movement. You had the anti-war movement. You had leaders being being picked off, you know, one by one. JFK, RFK, Martin Luther King, the leaders of the uh, various uh, leaders of the Black Panther movement, you know, were uh, were being picked off as well. Malcolm X, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a very chaotic, tumultuous time where there were all of these forces seemingly working to affect um you know major social changes and um and all of that kind of got eclipsed by the hippies slash flower children and you know and you know that most people now that is the prevailing image that they have of the the of that that era you know the hippies kind of symbolize all of that to most people 
Whereas from my point of view, the hippies were put in there to, to really derail <laughs> all of that and, yeah. uh, and distract away from it. And it worked because, you know, people now, the people, that's what they, you know, they, they, the, the anti-war movement and the hippies were, are one and the same in, uh, in most people's minds, you know, and, and a lot of the other movements are just all but forgotten. And, uh, you know, they just kind of came along and, and just sort of became the new face of the 60s and, and everything else kind of got pushed to the side. Hmm. How do you think it is that uh, the events and the happenings and the people of Laurel Canyon pretty much flew under the radar for the best part of 40 years? You know, because you, you, you mentioned the book that you read on holiday and that kind of uh, spurred you on to do your research, which was around about 2008, I think. So that was like... 40 plus years after the scene was in its heyday and it pretty much flew yeah. under the radar in all that time and now you've resurrected a whole load of new interest in it and people are joining dots and making connections and saying oh yeah you know we can see how this all fits together now but nobody seemed to be doing that for four decades you know it really flew under the radar this whole thing it really is odd isn't it that yeah that uh i mean the the grammy museum right here in la in conjunction with the getty museum is just now as we speak uh they are staging a an exhibit on the laurel canyon scene first time ever it opened uh, last month in may hmm. almost in conjunction with the release of my book which was just so bizarre um, you know my Very publisher useful. said Publisher set a release date of April 30th, and uh, as that was a per like two weeks before, I I just you know I'm reading through the LA Times, and there's an article telling me that the uh, Grammy Museum in a few weeks is going to be staging this uh, exhibit, and they have quotes from you know the people, the directors of the museum and whatnot, saying yeah you know we, well we've looked at all this other stuff and uh, and we thought you know we thought it was time to focus some attention right here on our own backyard and i'm like well yeah why did it take you 45 years to do it you know? yeah <laughs> and, yeah so yeah why has this story laid dormant for so long i mean from you know the mid 60s to up until like uh you know 2008 uh it was almost completely untold you yeah. know even the mainstream version was unknown and certainly my version was you know completely unknown but even the mainstream version had been swept under the rug for yeah. you know almost ha almost half a century um that's very strange you know that's just very bizarre that 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 it took so long for anyone to pay any attention to this hugely yeah. influential scene that had played out we seem to be living in an era of truth. You know, truth is just coming to the surface now in so many ways about so many things that have been hidden for so many years. You've got people speculating on new theories of who may have shot JFK. I mean, here in the UK, I know I've been talking with you on the email about this. We've got this whole scenario, this whole fiasco involving Jimmy Savile. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folk in the US probably don't even know who Jimmy Savile was. And, uh, you know, he got away with it for over 50 years, but it's all anyone's talking about here now. The whistle is blown on him, his name is Dirt, and that's how long it took for the truth to come out. But it does seem to get there in the end. You know, it may take 40, 50 years or more, but the lid is being lifted on so much now that's been hidden. Um, to some degree, yeah. I mean, um... There's more to come, yeah. surely. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, some of it is just like beating a dead horse to me, you know. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know how many how many more details of the uh, JFK assassination could be, you know, dredged up at this point. Yeah. You could fill in, you could fill an entire library with books, uh, you know, challenging the Warren report and blaming mm. it on, you know, everyone imaginable. Um, which is one of the reasons that I'm focusing on Lincoln, because, you know, in comparison, there's, uh, there's been 150 years for people to look at Lincoln, and yet there's... Uh, yeah, who there's, talks about Lincoln? You, you can hardly find a critical analysis of the uh, official Lincoln story, but uh, JFK, my God, that's been beaten to death for 50 years now, and... Mm. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot, you know, I mean, at some point it just becomes muddying the waters in my mind, you know, and I kind of feel the same way about like 911, you know, I, I think the the strongest points of the 911 case were made within the first couple of years, and then since then it's just sort of drifted off into all kinds of 
speculative uh, stuff about directed energy being weapons and hologram planes and God knows what. I guess with those and, two, uh, they're, they're, they're consistent, JFK and 9-11. Ever since those events, people have been speculating on what may or may not have happened, whereas the Laurel Canyon story was buried for, for decades. You know, it just it's, it's only come through in recent times. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, JFK was controversial right out of the gate, and 911 obviously also, and uh, and you know anything that happens now is uh, you know people immediately start dogpiling on it, whether it's the Boston Marathon or, or Sandy Hook or or whatever it is. I mean, there, there's not n- none of these stories are going to be re- are going to remain buried nowadays, but um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, the the nine one one thing. Yeah, so so that is a, yeah a major a major uh, difference is that this one uh, you know wasn't it's not the, it's not like this the story is now you know like the, the just the the dirty details are now emerging. It's the the entire story is just now emerging after all of these years. So yeah, yeah it's a it's a very stra- it's a very strange case. I would have to say it's um, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. They're very 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 odd. And let me ask you, how do you feel about the fact that it's been you as opposed to any other writer that's exposed this story and caused so many people to view that whole sort of era with a new perspective? I mean, it, it could have been any number of researchers that did it, and it was you. And I wonder if you feel in any way that it was kind of fated, that, that this was to be your defining work, this was to be what you did with your life, or do you not go in for that way of looking at things? Um... I don't know, you know. I, 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 um, I'm very proud of the work that I've done. Um, you know, I mean, when when I first started this, uh, when I first reported that that you know who Jim's dad actually was, which had been completely buried for 45 years, and no one had ever, it had never been in print. Mm. And you know, when I first put it out, I got I got blasted by from all directions. People were challenging it, saying, "What what's your source for this?" I, I've you know I've run I've run extensive searches, and I can't find any printed reference material to back you up and i was saying uh, i know that because no one's ever put it in print before that yeah. doesn't mean that it's not true mm. it just means that nobody ever put it in print before you know and uh so you know i took a lot of heat for that and then and then strangely enough a couple of years later the uh, admiral who was still alive up until a few years ago uh passed away and only then in his obituaries did the mainstream media finally report that he was in fact exactly who i said he was and uh, which was kind of cool because it, uh, it all of a sudden gave me a uh, credibility that I that i didn't have before and and some of my critic a lot of my critics kind of kind of quietly uh you know, retreated into back into wherever it was they came from. You yeah. know? And and um and that that you know, that's one of the things that really lit a fire under the story, um, was that. So so I'm 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 very proud of it to to a large degree. People tell me all the time, you know, hey, thanks for completely ruining the sixties for me or thanks for <laughs> yeah. thanks for ruining the doors for me. I can't listen to my favorite band anymore, you know, and I'm like, I, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Well, you know, just, the truth is the uh, truth, and it doesn't care you whether know, you like it or not. It carries on being um, the truth. Whether it's faded, I, you know, I mean, I've been accused of that. I, you know, people have, uh, people have basically kind of tried to paint this as uh, like I was handed this story um, by I don't know who my handlers, I guess I don't know for lack of a better word, um, specifically to position me as sort of the reigning authority the go-to guy on rock and roll conspiracies specifically so that i could then sir you know be the uh um the disinformation agent you know in in yeah. the, <laughs> or some you know people have painted these bizarre scenarios um you know uh not true, you know. I mean, uh, of course, I'm going to deny that. People have to draw their own conclusions. But you know, I've cer- I've certainly been accused of that. Um, but you know, wh- whether it was, I, I don't know. I, I I have no idea why I am the person who broke this story. I really don't. I'm um, I'm ju- I'm very proud of the work that I've done. Though I think I've done. A, I'm I'm very proud of the book. I'm very proud of the way it came out. And um, you know, people people are going to draw whatever conclusions they're going to draw. But, uh, you know, I know what my motivations are, so that, well, that's you, all you, I Well, you're nobody in this game until somebody calls you out as a shill. It's uh, it yeah. comes with the territory. 
Uh, I have been called controlled opposition, a limited hangout artist, a shill, a fraud, a fake, a phony, um, you name it. It's uh, CIA on, my own face, on my own Facebook page, a disinformation <laughs> yeah. card. That was my favorite one, disinformation tard. That's what. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even begin to tell you all the all the names that I've been called on my own page, and some of them are still on there. I yeah. I I I I, t I try to keep a maintain a free speech zone, but there are limits, you know. Well, exactly. One per one person actually started dragging my eighty year old mother and my daughter into it, which I drew the line there and banned yeah, them because they have nothing whatsoever to do with this, and uh, I thought that was just way out of line. Exactly. Um, but for the most part, I'll let people have their say. You know, they can accuse me of whatever they want. It's you yeah. know, that's... we've got the very important thing to do of telling people where they can get hold of the book. And I think you'd probably like to recommend some non-Amazon sources for the book. So let people <sighs> let people know where they can find it. Uh, well, I mean, my first preference is to get it directly from me on my website where I'm selling uh, signed copies, um, which is www.davesweb.cnchost.com is the homepage. Uh, if that's too hard to remember... You can just Google my name, and it'll generally be the first link that comes up, or Google the Center for an Informed America. And uh, once you get to my homepage, you will see uh, various links to the book order page prominently placed <laughs> around my page. And, uh, yeah, I am selling single copies and multiple copies of uh, Program to Kill, as, and also uh, my previous book, or... No, I mean, I'm selling uh, weird scenes. I'm sorry. My previous book, uh, Program to Kill, I'm also uh, selling either singly or in a uh, discounted combo package with the uh, weird scenes book. So I, I have various options available uh, to purchase either one separately or together. And um, can't quite compete with Amazon because they're pretty brutal with their pricing policies, but I'm uh, doing the best I can. And uh, I'll also be selling them actually in Laurel Canyon, of course, on Sunday, although that uh, doesn't really benefit anyone that's not in the L.A. area. But um, for, uh, for uh, actually less than what Amazon is selling them for, because there won't be any postage or PayPal costs. But uh, like I said, that really only benefits uh, people who might happen to be in the LA area. So um, hmm. the best way to get it is, uh, yeah, through, through the order page on my uh on my trusty website, my very primitive, um, never updated <laughs> website, is uh, yeah that that would be my first preference. Uh, and and if not, uh, then buy it from your local bookstore. Support your local bookstore. They are a dying breed, and they need to be supported before Amazon crushes them all out of existence. Yep, indeed. And your work on the Lincoln assassination, that's a web series right now, right? That's not a book. It is. All of my stuff, every, all of my books actually started as, as web series, and people actually have asked me if I'm going to turn this one into a book, and I do not, as of now, have any plans to do so. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's seven parts up. I actually have a part eight that I'm going to be putting up uh, probably this weekend. It's almost done, and uh, many more to come. And uh, it's a it's a fascinating topic to me because, uh, like I say, it's it's there's so few people that really know anything at all about the the Lincoln assassination. Um, you know, I mean, there there are people throughout the conspiracy community that can talk to you for days on the minutia of the JFK assassination, but uh, virtually no one that really has any kind of detailed knowledge at all on the uh, the Lincoln assassination. And mm -hmm. it, it's every bit as fascinating and and every bit as uh bizarre you know the the cast of characters and the deaths surrounding it and whatnot uh, there, there's there's so many parallels to uh it just makes you realize that the more things change the more they stay the same and uh you know a lot a lot of people like to think that if we could just you know a lot of people have these benchmarks you know they like to think well if we could just roll the clock back to before 911 everything was great then or if we could just just roll you know if we could just go back to before they took out kennedy you know everything was wonderful then and uh 
You know, I think what this uh, series is offers is, uh, you know, the, the perspective that uh, things have always been pretty screwed it was, up. It was messed up then, folks, as well. Yeah, yeah, it was messed up. It was messed up well before nine one one, well before JFK, well before whatever your benchmark is. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. Things have not changed all that much from 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 one hundred fifty years ago, really. And with John and, Wilkes uh, Booth, you get into some of the descendants of of you know the Booth family, and one of them that you mentioned was Sherry Booth, better known as Sherry Blair, the wife of the psychopathic mass murdering war criminal Tony Blair, which is a, a bit of a crazy one, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that, that uh, yeah, that a direct descendant could be could uh, in very recent times become a send. I don't know what you call them over there, the first lady of England. I, I, I don't know what you. Uh, what well, there's, there's lots of things she's called, really. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and like, and this in this hugely influential Claire Booth Luce, who you know was uh, you know in fairly you know contemporary times and. You know, I mean, that, that's just one of the weird things, you know. I mean, you don't you don't see, like, de- descendants of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, sitting in the House of Representatives or something like that, you know. Not really. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen all that often. Or, you know, Sirhan Sirhan's grandson, you know, being a Supreme <laughs> Court justice or something, you know. I mean, yeah. you don't really see that. But with the Booth family, they're still very much prominent in both the U.S. and in the U.K. and in the... Uh, you know, various political positions. It's just uh, yeah. kind of odd, really. Yeah. You know? Great to talk to you today. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. No problem. Thank you.